So please, everyone that's in this room, make sure everyone else uh, has it as well. And uh, so tonight we're going to be picking up from Acts chapter 22, where we left off on Sunday. Acts chapter 22, verse 22, all the way to Acts chapter 23, verse 11. And the title of tonight's lesson is Effective Preaching. Uh, if we start from verse 22 to 24, Acts chapter 22, verse 22 to 24, it says, The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he is not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. So this is, you know, what we left off last uh, Sunday. But uh, what's going on here is that Paul is now preaching to the, <clears throat> sorry, to the crowd from the temple, right? And he's preaching and the crowd was listening and listening and listening. And so pretty much everyone in the crowd was listening to what Paul was saying until Right at the end, Paul said something that then caused the whole Jewish crowd to erupt. Now, you may be asking, well, what did Paul actually say that caused these people to just be ticked off, right? Well, if you go to verse 21, just above 22, uh, well, that's where 21 is. But anyways, in verse 21, it says, and this is Paul still speaking, and he says, Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away from, uh, to the Gentiles. And so this is what Paul says, and he's, as soon as these guys hear that, they just get ticked off. I mean, the Bible talks about, like, you know, they started screaming. It's like, hey, this person does not deserve to live. He's not worthy to live. And then they start throwing off their cloaks, right? I don't have a cloak with me, but, uh, I mean, this is something closer, right? They just, like, throw it like that and flicking dust, and they were like, you know, this person should die. That's how mad they were. And it's funny because we look at it, it's like, the Jews weren't really mad at the fact that, you know, they were preaching to the Gentiles. But they were mad at the fact that now they see that the G Gentiles, for some weird reason, are getting these privileges uh, without having to obey circumcision and the law. And so there was this bit of uh, jealousy and bitterness in them because they were like, man, this is so hard to accept. Like these people, they weren't God's chosen people. How could they just come and have a relationship with God? And they started reflecting on their own lives, and they were like, man, our, our lives were so religiously hard. Why is it that the Gentiles get it so easily? You know, and that's what was going on in their hearts. And they, started, they were just seriously mad. But it helps us understand because what it teaches us is that religion really is hard. But a relationship with God is not. You know, religion becomes a set of things that you have to do, Right? But a relationship with God is like, no, no, your heart for God is your heart for God. Now, the things you do is a byproduct of them, but it doesn't become a list of things you need to do. Yeah. You know, for example, I, I look at me and my wife, right? Like I said, I've survived. Hey, man, I'm here. But anyways, I make my wife dinner not because I'm a husband or it's the role of a husband, but it's because I'm in love with her, right? I love my wife, therefore, I make her dinner. But I don't make her dinner because I'm a husband. Does that make sense? Um, but we have to understand that everything comes down to our relationship with God. You know, I remember when I was uh, leading in the East. I was, I was leading the East region. And I was leading a Bible talk called, called uh, Beasts in the East. Terrible name. I don't know who came up with it. But um, Beasts in the East. I believe I made my Bible talk bitter because... I mean, JT was in the Bible talk. She didn't know because she was like, oh, Jesus is good. You know, I just became a disciple. You know, she was a young Christian. But anyways, I believe I made my, some of my Bible talk members really bitter because at that time, I started getting bitter myself. And I was looking at it. I was like, man, I have to disciple four people. I have to, like, lead Bible discussions. Um, you know, on, on Wednesday, I had to lead Bible discussions on Friday. On top of that, I have to do my studies, and, and I now have to share my faith. And it became a list of all these different things that I had to do. And all I could see was Christianity was about self-denial. Like, that's all I was seeing. I was like, man, a relationship with God is self-denial. And what I realized was I totally forgot about my love for God. It was like everything I complained about, there was no, oh, well, God is doing this or God is doing that. It was more like, man, I have to do this and this and this and this and that. And I really started to get bitter. 
But one thing I really just want to nail down with all of you guys tonight. Now, there's a couple others that will go on through the points, but effective preaching comes down to our hearts for God, to our relationship with God. Let me just repeat that. I know that we all know that, but do we really know that? It's like effective preaching comes down to us knowing God. Because if you guys go to John 15, verse 5, now, John 15, verse 5 is not in the notes, but uh, please share your Bibles if the person next to you doesn't have it. John 15, verse 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So this is Jesus speaking, and he's like, Look, look, I, I am the vine, right? I am the vine that grows. Every single one of you guys is a branch. Um, and a branch that is not connected to me, you can't do anything. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever seen a branch, like, you know, grow from the ground or whatsoever? Like, it, it doesn't work like that. Jesus was like, hey, if you guys remain in me, things will happen. You know, and, I, and I say that because that is the fundamental thing. Now, we will talk, like I said, we will talk about the others um, in the points that's to come, but... The underlying thing is that even as we see Paul's life, Paul knew God. You know, and I just want to emphasize that because it's the number one thing we should understand. Because even as I look at our own church, right? I mean, I, I look at the story about Felice. Uh, where's Felice? Oh, Felice? But anyways, you guys know the story about Felice, right? So, I don't know, two weeks year old as a Christian. And then she's given this person to study the Bible where she was like, man, I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Like, no wisdom. Like, I don't know. I just know that... Jesus died for all, but hey, let's go have a four-hour quiet time, right? And then we see that, come Jaja, come Allison, and you know, we, we see the ripple effect of it. But I really want to emphasize because it is about that. You know, it's not about, yes, we need to know our Bibles and all these different things, but if it, do we really know God? I mean, I look at that and I'm like, four hours quiet time? Sheesh. When was the last time we had a four-hour quiet time, you know? It's like... It's crazy because it was about this idea that it's like, no, I don't know anything, but I do know this. There's this God up there that, I don't know, when I pray, things happen. When I pray, there's peace. When I pray, something happens. I just want you to experience it. Hey, let's go have a four-hour quiet time, All right? And I want to encourage you guys, like, have we forgotten that? You know, when we read our Bibles, when we get up in the morning, do we read our Bibles because we want to know our Bibles or do we want to know God? You know, even when I finished reading the Bible, uh... As, and within my first year as a Christian, right? Within my first year as a Christian, I read the Bible and then I was like, oh, well, now what? What more do I have to read? But I totally missed the point because it's not about knowing the Bible. It's knowing who God is. You know, I even think of Chi. When Chi came over from Chicago, you know, it was this gangster dude. Everyone knows, right? He was like, yo, 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 you know? It's like, I mean, you saw him leading up here. It's like, glory, glory, yeah. Like, he still got it. But anyways... When Chi came from America, he was only nine months old as a Christian. And then, you know, Chi started baptizing people right and left, right, left and center. Now, it wasn't anything special about Chi, but Chi was someone that knew God, right? And I want to encourage us also, it's like, the Bible speaks of all these great things. It's like, guys, we don't need much to be effective in preaching. We just need to know God. Are you that someone today? And so, you know... Things go on and everyone's going crazy. And then the commander comes in and he takes Paul away and he puts him to safety because he's like, I don't understand all this babbling that's going on, right? I don't know what's going on, this different language, but let me just get to the root of this issue. And so he takes him in and then, you know, we arrive to our, uh, if you go on in the notes, we arrive to our point number one, wisdom and preaching. So if we move on to Acts chapter 22, uh, verse 24 to 30. Acts chapter 22, verse uh, 24 to 30. It says, He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he said to the commander and reported it, What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? 
Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, so the next day he released them in order that the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. So, continuing on right here, you know, they, they take Paul, right? And, and, and right here, the commander then took Paul and he was trying to have him examined by flogging. Now, this wasn't a punishment type of flogging. This was more of extracting the truth from him. You know, it's like those movies where the bad guys just take the victim and it's like, hey, tell me something or I will shoot you, right? Something like that. Or maybe like they say, oh, well, well, if you don't tell me the truth, I'll torture you, right? And that's what they were trying to do here. Now, to help you guys understand how big this was, this wasn't some sort of normal flogging that we hear. Now, in those days, history explains that usually when they try to get people to tell the truth and they flog them, it, results, it usually results in death. And they say that very few people survive this type of flogging because the flogging was, uh, the flo um, sorry, the whip was made of leather and it had like these, um, you know, these sharp ends of, of made of bones or made of lead. And what they would do is whenever they strike the person, it will rip the flesh off. And so, and that's what they were trying to do. Why? Because they were trying to get the truth out, out of um, Paul. And the Romans at that time, they always saw it, this is the most effective way that we can get the truth out. You know, we look at that and it's like, you know, the cost of preaching for Paul was seriously high. You know, we must always consider our struggles when we look at that, right? Because Paul even goes on in his resume um, in 2 Corinthians 11. He talks about, you know, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I've received the, the Jews, sorry, from the Jews, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a, a night and day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And so Paul is here. He's like, man, this is, this is exactly what I'm going through. You know, sometimes us as a disciple, we've got to really consider or just keep in perspective like our struggles. You know, maybe someone just rejects us as sharing and we're like, oh, man, I feel just like Paul. You know, oh, oh man, Job got persecuted by his friends. I got persecuted by my friends, man. I feel just like Job, right? But um, it's not like that. Like these guys, they went through serious trials. And sometimes, you know, even we feel like, man, three times a week, man, that's a lot of meetings. And then we, on top of that, we got to share our faith and it becomes this list of things to do. And it's like, we look at Paul and it's like, holy moly, you know, it's just like he was in danger almost everywhere. It's like, he said he was in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger at seas. Like everywhere he went, he was in danger. You know, um, you know. I, I, I look at that and I'm like, we are really blessed here in Sydney. Yeah. That is the truth. You know, when I went to the um, to the uh, GLC conference in Manila, I heard of a couple in the Philippines that they had to travel several miles to get to church. As a result of that. You know, they, they had to leave uh, Saturday evening to be able to make it at church, I think about in the morning on Sunday. And they did that every single week. No complaints. They were like, you know what, this is the kingdom of God. This is for God. We're going. You know, even as I look at Tegan, you know, sometimes we, we can consider, well, the distance is a lot, right? Tegan, um, you know, uh, Sean's wife and, yeah, Tegan Valenzuela, right? Anyways, she's leading a church in New Zealand, right? She's married. All these great things has happened, but... You look at how when she began as a disciple, man, she traveled all the way from Liverpool, right? Liverpool, every single time, three times a week, every single sharing time, she was there. And then we look at, like, disciples in India. I mean, I don't even have to introduce. It's 
come out and they're like, yeah, I'm all good. Let's, do, let's go. You know, and they just start praising God. They're like, God, you know, I love you. I love you. Blessed be thy name. And it's like, this it just goes on and on. And even as I, I think of our, you know, brothers and sisters in the Philippines, you know, I look at that and I know you all know Naomi, right? Naomi, hero of us, of us all. But um, I remember she was saying that when she was staying in the Philippines, they stayed in like a quarter of this room. Right? There were about five sisters that stayed in about a quarter of this room. A majority of them just slept on the floor. And they also had a kid with them as well. And it's like, we look at that, it's like, holy moly. Like, I look at my king size bed, it's like, you know, what troubles do I have? And I just want to encourage you guys with that because I see in Australia, it's incredible, right? Are you with me, church? Yeah. And so, you know, it goes on and he's, and he's about to be flogged, right? So they stretch him out to be flogged. And then Paul goes on and plays his trump card. He then uses his citizen. I don't know what it would have been like, but maybe he was like, I don't know, like getting stretched out. It's like, bro, I'm a Roman citizen, you know? You better watch out. But anyways, he does that, and it's like, the, the commander then freaks out. He's like, whoa, this guy's a Roman citizen? What are we trying to do? And to give you an indication, it was a big thing to even put a Roman citizen in chains. You know, in, in, in uh, ancient documents, uh, a guy named Cic Cicero, he was, a f he was a famous Roman statesman, and he served as a consul in 63 BC. And he said that it is a misdeed for a Roman citizen to be bound. It is a crime for him to be beaten. It is almost as bad to murder a father to kill him. And so the commander saw that, and he was like, what have we just done? Let's let this guy go. And so they freed Paul, and then they were like, well, we just freed him, and I don't know what to do with him, but we still need to find out what's going on. And so they take him to the Sanhedrin, and, you know, finally Paul is released, right? And we can learn something from that because we have to understand is that when we, when we go and evangelize or as disciples, we're not seeking persecution, right? Persecution doesn't define Christianity. I mean, we do get persecuted, but we go out to seek and save the lost, not to seek persecution, yeah. right? We seek to save, not seek to die. Amen, church? Yeah. Um, I mean, you look at it, it's like, now, there were times that Paul, you know, faced persecution for the truth, but he wasn't facing, you know, he wasn't always looking for a quick death. Why? Because he always saw his life as, you know, as long as I'm alive, I can be of offer to God and of God's people. You know, I, I have to apologize as well, because when I talk about China, all I talk about is gunshots and death, and it's like, man, these Chinese people, they're going to die, right? But it's like, like what Joe said on Sunday, no, it's, it's not about dying. It's a moment, you know? And some of us on the Chinese mission team, we have that privilege of having that trump card. You know, someone like, cheese, what, American? So I don't know, maybe when you're about to get flogged, you can just be like, hey, I'm American. You want World War II? You know? Or maybe you're Australian like Ray, and you could be like, hey, I'm Australian. You know, don't, don't let the... Yeah. Don't let the, uh, I don't know, but anyways. Um, <laughs> anyways, you guys get it, right? Don't let the crocodile man or whatever it is come, right? Something like that. And so we always have to look at that and look at how can we be wise in preaching, right? We're not seeking to die. Get that. So, you know, although we evangelize not seeking persecution, we will at some point, you know, receive persecution. And we, to, we also have to be careful because... When we are persecuted for the wrong reasons, no glory is going to go to God. But when we are persecuted for the righteous reasons, then the glory all goes to God. You know, in Matthew 5, verse 10 to 11, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. You know, just some tips that I've given in the... Um, on effective preaching and evangelism, first of all, and we all know this and we've heard it time and time again, look for open people, not to open up closed people. I sometimes get guilty of this because, you know, I could stay in there and just try to be like, hey, you know, uh, you know, philosophically, uh, you know, whatever these different arguments is, like, this is, like, there is a God. But then I ended up getting persecuted. I'm like, hey, amen, you know, let's leave. But that is what we're trying to do, is we're trying to look for open people. Um, you know, you look to win people over, not disagree or judge. Whenever you, not, not only is this true when we evangelize, 
But whenever we bring up things with people, we must always think, am I bringing this up to win them over? Or am I bringing this up because I'm emotional or, or I've judged them? Or is there something wrong with it? You know, we must always think like that. You know, we've we got to look to love others and free them from the deceitful, deceitfulness of sin and Satan. Not condemn them where they're at or remember, not the, sorry, not to condemn them where they are at, but also remember that we were there at one point. You know, in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 11, it says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will inherit the kingdom of God? Sorry, will not inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is, some of, that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You know, I, I always think of this scripture because even as I disciple the guys that I disciple, right? It, giving me a lot of problems. Um, <laughs> no, nah, I love you guys. No, nah, I'm just joking. But anyways, even as I disciple the guys that I disciple, I'm like, first of all, when I'm bringing up something with them, am I bringing up something to win them over? And also, when they've done something wrong, am I quick to point it out? Or do I sit back and I'm like, I wonder how much Joe had to be patient with me as well when I was in my sin. Mm -hmm. Or better yet, I wonder how much God had to be patient with me when I was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that always helps me put things into perspective. And I'm like, okay, well, this is how I should do it. And this is how it should be done. And also, um, have a joyful and welcoming open line. And a joyful objection overcome up. Sorry, joyful objection lines will always, you know, win people over. So something like, I don't know, a, a soft voice or something like, you know, a soothing response. You know, when I, even when I have times with brothers or, I don't know, when I talk to people and they start like coming at me, right, going back and forth. I'm like, God, please, please, calm down, okay? Just let, just let me respond. Just, just hear me out. You're not listening. And that's what I do. I mean, imagine if I was just like, just listen to me, don't, it, ah, you know, it just doesn't work that way. But that is how it is. It's like, we just always have to be the ones in control. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Sweet. Point number two, dealing with the religious. Um, in Acts 23, verse 1 to 11, it says, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was a high priest. For it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to, take, to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem. So you must also testify in Rome. So here, you know, Paul is dragged around, right? So he preaches a sermon. Everyone erupts. They take him out. They're about, he's about to be flogged. And then they realize he's a Roman citizen. And then they take him out to, to uh, put him in a uh, Sanhedrin, right? Now, the commander wanted to take him to the Sanhedrin because he was like, well, he's a Roman citizen. I can't beat the truth out of him. But you know what? Let's take him to the Sanhedrin. Because we have to get to the root of this issue. we got to solve this out. And it's interesting because Paul gets there, right? And he looks at everyone. He looks at them directly. and It's like this, this feeling of, I'm not even afraid of every single one of you guys. 
And he looks at him and he's like, brothers. Now what's interesting about that is, usually when people are in the Sanhedrin, they always refer to them as elders of Israel or uh, rulers of the people. Right? Because even when Peter was in the Sanhedrin and also Stephen, they, re they refer to the, to the Pharisees that way. And Paul gets up there and he's like, you know, but I love. You know, it's like, I don't know how it was. It's like, hey, brothers. And then he goes on with his sermon. A lot of people speculate that, you know, Paul was probably really rude at this moment. He was equating himself to the rulers of the people. And he was like, you know, these are, these are my brothers, right? Or he was probably rude or offensive. But some people as well say that it wasn't because he was rude, but he said that out of the fact that he was a Pharisee himself. I mean, if you guys look at the scripture, he said, you know, I am a Pharisee. And so when Paul was preaching, maybe he was even preaching to some of his classmates. You know, maybe he was even preaching to some of the people that he used to study with. And so, you know, he addressed the Sanhedrin. And so at, at that time, he goes on and he's like, look, my conscience is clear before God to this day. And as soon as he said that, you know, the, the, the high priest Ananias calls to the person next to, to Paul and, and then the person just strikes him, hits him in the face, and then he calls out, hey, you're a whitewashed wall. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know what a whitewashed wall is, but in those days, whitewashed wall referred to these whitewashed tombs. Now, if you guys remember, the Israelites are not allowed to touch any form of uh, dead body, whether it's an animal or a person, because if they touch it, they become unclean. And so what they would do is when they bury a person, they would whitewash all these tombs. And so, and so Paul here is like, hey, you're exactly that whitewashed tomb. You know, because you say that I shouldn't do this, and yet you struck me, yet the Bible says otherwise. And, and so we see here because, you know, Paul really understood that, you know, in Exodus 28, 22, verse 28, it says, do not blaspheme God or curse the ruler of your people. So after Paul says that, he was confronted. Hey, how, how dare you say that to the ruler of our people? And Paul's like, oh, sorry about that. I, did, I, I didn't know he was the leader. You know, I didn't know he was the leader of the people. I mean, look at the guy. But anyways, it, it, it helps us understand because it speaks to us in a sense because we look at that and it's like, well, even as the elections go on right now, right? Sometimes we could be like, oh, this leader is that, this leader is that. But it's like, you know, we have to pray for peace rather than, you know, talk about how bad our leaders are, even though they are bad. But anyways, amen. Um, but to give an indication of how bad Ananias was, this high priest, he was known to be a glutton. He was also known to be a thief. And it was known that, you know, whenever they would give the tithes in the temples, Ananias was always the one that was, that was stealing off them. And so we see here that immediately... When Ananias did something wrong, Paul called him and he was like confronted him with the sin. It's like, hey, you just committed sin because this is what the Bible says. And as, as Christians, we must also learn not to ever fear confronting or bringing up things to religious people. You know, when, when, we, when we deal with religious people, we must never be afraid to call them out of their sin or to call them um, of the sin that they're in. Why? Because... Looking at religion itself, it's very blinding. You know, religion is like this worship of God with no heart. And then it becomes this thing where we've got to then sort of kickstart the heart, right? Now, I remember when I was even studying the Bible, you know, when Joe told me to repent, I was like, what is repent, you know? I've never heard of that word before. And it's like, I remember when I did the word of God, I was like, what? It wasn't because I was confused because I found it hard to accept. I was like, Wait, so, so an ancient book is telling me about this and this and that. It's like, man, we're in like, I don't know, like robot century now. You know, we, we deal with robots. We don't deal with books. And seriously, that's what I was thinking because I was like, I don't really think it applies today. And so what only changed me was the fact that, you know, I was deep in my sin. And I was like, man, I need to run back to God. And I knew that, you know, these guys were the only committed ones. So let's run back there. And at the, in the same way, it's like religious people sometimes need something dramatic or some shaking up for them to realize their sin. And so when we convert the, the religious, you know, we must never be afraid to speak to them the truth and love, not just love. In Ephesians 4 verse 15, it says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. 
You know, I met this, I met this um, religious dude, uh, I believe, on Monday. So I was evangelizing, and I met this guy named Ben. Now, I don't know if you guys know Ben, but Brian Lynn met him, right? And he studied with, um, and he studied with uh, Jeremy and, and, uh, and some of the boys in, in Sydney Uni. And me and Elias were just talking to this guy, and he was like, bro, the, the reason why I didn't continue on the Bible studies or I didn't come to your church was, you know, your church said this, and my church said that, and then your church said, hey, come to church. And my church said, uh, no, you're all good the way you are. And I, and I looked at him and I was like, bro, I don't know if you're hearing yourself right now, but there is no reference of God in there. It's like, I, I haven't heard you say, like, well, what does Jesus say? What does God say? What does the Bible say? I've just heard you say, my church this, my church that, and the list goes on. And I'm like, I'm just trying to call you, man. It's like, you need to repent. Um, because the issue is here. It's not, and he was saying, well, I don't really believe in baptism. And I'm like, bro, the issue is not baptism. The issue is you haven't repented. And I was like, when was the last time you read your Bible? And he was like, I, I don't know, two months ago. And I was like, that's the issue, man. You're like, you're not looking at God. You're looking at all these different churches. And so in the same way, you know, never be afraid to call them out. And then, you know, Paul goes on and he, and he talks about, you know, I am a Pharisee. And the reason why I stand here is the resurrection of the dead. And then some of the Pharisees, you know, they're looking at that and it's like, yeah, that's our guy, you know, that's, that's Paul. And we see here even the hypocrisy of religious people because the Pharisees, they were like, you know, this guy's done nothing wrong. You know, at first they were like, this guy needs to die. But now it's like, no, this guy is one of us. And then the Sadducees were like, no, 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 that's not true. Whatever he's preaching is not true. And what they were talking about was, the Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not. The Pharisees, they believed in spirits. Um, the Sadducees did not. Um, the Pharisees, they also believed in predestination. And the Sadducees were like, no, it's free will. We just, I don't know, for some weird reason, we just are free to choose. And as a result, the Sanhedrin was split in two. And everyone started arguing against each other. And so, you know, as a result, the, the Sanhedrin split in two and the violent argument continued on. And so we see here, it's like, this is how religious people are. You know, sometimes it's like you, you point it out and we see the cleverness of Paul. He's like, hey, this is why I'm standing here. And then everyone's just starting getting crazy at each other. Um, and then in conclusion, you know, effective preaching. Our goal is not to simply preach and feel good about ourselves, but to preach effectively. This takes, number one, Wisdom in preaching and dealing with the religious. And so, it, even at this last passage, at the end we see that, you know, we see that Jesus comes and takes comfort of Paul, right? Many say that this was the last time that Paul was ever free. As soon as he went into prison at this time, he was prison forever. And then he started like writing all these different books like Colossians, Corinthians, and, you know, the books to the churches. And what's incredible is that, you know, Jesus always comes in times of need. But I want to encourage you guys, you know, wisdom in preaching, dealing with the religious, that's effective preaching, and that's a lesson for tonight.